Well, happy Mother's Day for, to you mothers out there and future mothers. Huh. I know, you guys are all smiling at each other. Oh, you're so cute. I know. <laughs> oh. What a gift it is, seriously. What a gift God has given us to be able to produce life like this. I, I don't know. I just think it's amazing that God has given women the ability to create and bring forth life in that way, right? Like, that is amazing. I think that's so incredible. So, what a gift. Today we're going to be talking about the things that people are going to be acting like in the end times. We're kind of continuing on with what we were talking about in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, but we're going to be starting in on chapter 3 in verse 1. And I'll tell you, the timing couldn't be better because, it, if man, in this country... I don't think there's any greater attack than there is on women, even though it can look like a silent thing and it can even look like a freeing thing sometimes, like they wanna give you freedom, but this world doesn't wanna give people freedom in any way. It just wants to set people in bondage. So let's start reading in 2 Timothy chapter three, where it says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For of this sort are are those who creep into houses and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, also learning and yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Man, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. That, Lord, it just, man, it, it spreads throughout all generations, God. It covers everything. It's living and active. And God, I pray that you would use it in our lives right now, that you would bind the enemy from this place, that you would bind the enemy from our hearts, and that you would draw us to you, draw our hearts to you right now in this time, God, and do amazing, 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 amazing things. God, would it just be of you? Would you speak to each one of us? Not of me, not of any man, God, but just you. We want to hear from you, God. That's what we're here for. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, God is so good to line this up the way that he always does for us. In the things going on in each one of our lives, man, it seems like he just takes his word and expounds upon it. And that's the amazing thing about who God is, is he'll take the exact situations that you're going through right now in your life, And then you'll read through his word and it's like, he'll speak directly to you. He'll touch your heart right where you're at. And that's, I don't know, that's what he's done for me because here's the thing, I I mean, for me, my parents were divorced when I was growing up. Like they, I think when I was like a year, year and a half, they split up and I was raised part-time by my mom, part-time by my dad. And so I saw the struggles that my mom went through being like a single mother, raising two kids, and all the difficulties that came along with that. And man, I I can't tell you how much the difficulties came from chasing after the things of the world and believing in the things of the world instead of going after God and believing in the things that he says. Because, I mean, that is the ultimate gift that he's given us. A lot of people look at the word of God as if, It's like a prison cell holding you back from all the things that you could do. God bless you. Holding you back from all the things that you could do, the opportunities opportunities that you could have in this life. But instead, the word of God is, yeah, you could see it like a cell, but it's a protective cell. It's like a protect, you, you know, like you live in a house, right? Why do you live in a house? Because it would be scary to just go and sleep out on the ground, right? 
So you go into a house, you lock the door behind you, and you sleep in it. You have to look at the word of God like that. You go into it, you apply it to your life, and it'll protect you from the things that are outside. It'll protect you from the crazy things. But so often we do the opposite. We think the word of God is archaic and it doesn't apply to this time now. And oh, that was just cultural stuff back then. And we're like, oh, no, I'm going to do something else with my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after the things that the culture is going after. We're going to go after social justice. We're going to make sure that everyone in Palestine is liberated and all the other things of this life, all, all the slaves are set free and all these things. And in the midst of all of that, they forget what's most important. Because God said that he will set the captives free. But you have to understand that when Jesus came, his whole nation, the Jews, were in slavery. And after he died on the cross, guess what? They were still in slavery. So you see the difference of what God actually cares about and what he came for. He didn't come to set people free physically. He came to set people free spiritually. He said that the one who sins is a slave to sin. They're a slave to themselves. And they're a slave to the enemy. Isn't that what Paul was talking about in the, at the end of this last chapter, chapter 2? He was saying that the people that are going after the things of this world... They're a slave to themselves, and they're held captive by the enemy to do his will. They're doing the will of the devil, and yet they might not even know it. You look at this world, and this world and all the social justice things that come about, people are trying to like, I suppose some of them could be well-meaning, to like help people's lives and set them free from the bondage that they're in. But unless God comes into it somehow, unless the word of God is preached and people come to know him, they will always be in bondage. Always. Not only in this life, but in the next life as well. In their eternal life, they'll be in bondage. God says that that's what he wants to set us free from. But in order to be set free from those things, you have to take the word of God and hold it paramount. Hold it as the pinnacle. The one thing that you live your life by that everything else is tested by, not the opposite. A lot of people go the, the way of the world and then they'll say, oh yeah, like the, the word of God it has some cool things. Yeah, like if you live your life by it, it'll make your life better. No, it's, it's so much more than that. It's so much greater than that. It is the one thing that if you choose to live your life by, it will set you free from all the things that you're chasing after in this life. Think about it. Think about all the things that you've gone after in this life. Have they ever satisfied you? Have they ever made your life so much better that you never wanted anything else? No. In fact, it does the opposite of that, right? It does the exact opposite. It only sets yourself in a greater bondage than you were in before. Because now you're chasing after all these things that can't satisfy you, thinking that they're going to satisfy you. So the moment that you get whatever you were chasing after, it only leaves you in a more depressed state than you were before. Isn't it crazy what a paradox it is? Isn't it crazy how upside down it is? Though the world says, if you chase after these things, you'll, you'll climb the ladder, ladder. You'll get higher and higher. You'll do better and better things. And yet people do those things. They get higher and higher and they're on top of the world. And yet they're more empty than they've ever been. They've chased after things that don't satisfy. And look at this list that Paul gives us here. Is this not like our culture to the T? I mean, look at what he says. He says, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, 
unforgiving, without self-control. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Does that not explain our culture and define our culture in every way? That's who we are as people. Naturally, this is who we all are. In fact, I was looking at this list and I was thinking to myself, you know, the best thing to do with the word of God is when you're reading through it, apply it to yourself. A lot of people will take the word of God and they'll think of somebody else that should apply it, right? Oh, if this person would apply it, then my life would be so much better. No, you take the word of God and you apply it to yourself. And when you apply the word of God to yourself, the world can be made better and you can make the people around you better as well. But you have to apply it. So I'm applying this to myself. I'm looking at all these things and I'm like, yeah, I'm that. Yeah, I'm that. Yeah, I'm that. Oh, I've been that for sure. Going down the whole list. This is who we are naturally as people. It's only God who can set you free from these things. It's only him. He desires to do that great work in each one of us. It's about allowing him to do that. Paul says that these things are spiritual things. They're not just physical. And so we've been talking, excuse me, about sharing our faith. And he says, if you're going to talk to someone about the Lord and share the gospel with them, you're not just entering into a physical battle. You're entering into a spiritual battle. It's not just about what's on the outside. Yeah, you might talk to someone about the Lord and they might totally come against you physically. But what's behind all that is the spiritual. Let me give you this example. We talked about Judas already today. You know, Judas Iscariot, the disciple of Jesus who then went against him and betrayed him. When he's there having the last supper with Jesus, remember he had already made plans with the chief priests. He had already gone to them and said, hey, how much will you give me? How much will you pay me if I deliver Jesus over to you? So his heart was willing to betray already. But then at the last supper, Jesus hands him, he dips the bread in the the wine And he hands it to him. Remember, John asked him, hey, who's the one who's going to betray you? Jesus says, oh, it's the one whom I give this bread to. He dips it, hands it to Judas, and Judas eats it. And it says, at that moment, the devil entered into him to go and do the devil's will. You see the picture that he's giving us. So yeah, Judas in his own heart, in his own will, He desired to betray Jesus. But then, the spiritual side of it, he got empowered by the enemy to betray Jesus as well. So you see both the physical and the spiritual coming together. And that's why Paul says this in Ephesians 6, verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So he's saying it's not the physical that we wrestle against, but it's the spiritual that's empowering the physical. You guys all picking up what I'm putting down? Right? There's the physical And then there's the spiritual that empowers that physical to go forward and do that work. Just as we saw in Judas, he had a heart to do the work of the enemy. And so then the enemy came into him and empowered him to do that work. Look, it's the same thing in our culture today. People are running away from God. They're running away from the things of God. They don't desire God. They have a sense of godliness. Isn't that what he says here? He says they have a sense of godliness. You ever heard this? Oh, be kind to one another. Just be kind. It's pretty popular, isn't it? Yet people take that, and that's godliness, right? To be kind to other people. But then they deny the power of God that is behind kindness. 
It's not about God. It's just, hey, oh, if you would just be kind to everyone, then we wouldn't need God. We wouldn't need anything else. Let's all just be kind to one another. How's that working for all of us? Not coming out too well, right? I think we have all seen this culture slide down, down, and further down. Even in the short time that I've been alive, I've seen it go leaps and bounds off the cliff. It was like we were up here and then a straight drop and people just said, hey, let's just jump off. You ever see like penguins in Antarctica? And they're like on the top of the glacier and they're all piled up to the edge. And they're pretty soon like there's a bunch of them standing on the ledge. And then they start pushing each other off. They like belly bump each other like this. And once the first one goes, then they all just start going for it. That's what our culture looks like right now. We're all just piled up to the edge and someone already jumped off. And now more and more people are just jumping off the side. Why? It's not a good idea. Sure, it looks fun. But it only leads to worse things for us. It only leads to worse things. As Christians, God has something so much greater for us something so much better. And though we will experience difficulty, don't tell them, don't get me wrong here. I'm not telling you that because you're a Christian, everything is going to be great in your life. And if you just follow the word of God, that everything is going to be all cheery and you're going to be running through a field of daisies your whole life. No, that, that's not the way it is. God promised us. He said, in this life, you will have tribulation. You're going to. But what does he say after that? He says, but take heart because I have overcome the world. In this world, you have many tribu much tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's what he says to us. Yeah, you're going to go through some tough things, but understand that he already has the victory over all those things. If you trust in him, if you hope in him, if you believe in him, if you continue in his word, in the things that he desires for you, it will all work out for you in the end. It may not be all happy, cheery here, but he says that doesn't matter. The things of this life will pass away. They'll all be gone one day. But the things of the next life will remain forever. That's what he's trying to push us all towards. Understand, as we get closer and closer to the end times, I mean, Paul says here, Verse one, but you know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And then he lists off all these things of what the last days will look like. And we all agreed that this looks like our culture right now, right? So what does that tell you? That tells you that we're getting close. I've been having this um, vision in prayer. When I pray, like I, I envision God around me and he's been giving me this vision and he's looking to the south and there's a sunset and the sunset, like if you ever watch the sunset, you know, like it gets lower and lower Well, we're like at the crest and there's a sunset and it's like almost reaching the land to where it's going to disappear. And he just says to me, this is where we're at. We're at the sunset. I, I think it's strange that it's toward the south. And I've asked him about that. He hasn't answered me yet. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Maybe he'll line that up somehow. But you see the picture, though. Like, we're at a point in this world. It's coming to a close. And you have to understand, when it, the closer and closer we get to it coming to that close the more desperate the enemy is going to get with all of us, with the people that follow God. Because he knows that his days are numbered. He knows his time is short. The enemy's main goal is that he would not have to spend forever in hell by himself. So he wants to drag as many people as possible with him. Misery loves company. It doesn't want to be alone in it. That's what he desires to do. And that's why 
he goes out into the world and he sows these lies saying, oh, just live this life up. Just do everything you possibly can because once you die, that's it. YOLO, you only live once. So live it up. Do everything you can out there. You only get one shot at it. He wants everyone to believe that so that they don't think about what happens after death. He wants people to be focused right here. <laughs> we were talking, you ever notice how when you're doing the things that the Lord wants you to do, it's like all of a sudden there's a spiritual attack on all the things that you're doing in this life. And they always seem to be, mm, I would say, the worldly things that you're chasing after. You know, there's the spiritual thing where God is doing this work, but then in all the worldly things, there comes the spiritual attack in your life and everything else that's not of him. And it's all fighting against those things. What do you think God's trying to tell us? Hey, when you're coming toward the spiritual, you need to let go of the physical things. When you're coming towards God, you need to let go of the world. You have to trust him. Is God going to call every single one of us to give up everything for him? Maybe not to like, you know, physically give up everything, but to spiritually give up everything. Absolutely he is. That's the call that he's given to each one of us. Maybe he doesn't call you to sell everything physically and just like walk around like the disciples did with Jesus and have nothing but have everything at the same time. But spiritually, emotionally, to be willing to give everything up for him. That's what he calls us to do. Jesus said, if you're not willing to lay everything down for me, you're not worthy of me. Because what I have for you is greater than everything else you could possibly have in this life. If you had everything combined, just what Jesus could give you would be better than that. So much better. And so he understands, hey, if people aren't willing to come after me, if people aren't willing to give up everything else, then they're not worthy of the things that I can give them. So it's the same thing when we go to share the gospel with people. You know, we've been talking about how people will, some people will attach themselves to it. Some people will receive the word of God and other people won't. But a lot of times as Christians, we can get hung up on that. Hung up on the people who don't receive it, right? And we'll almost get to the point of begging them to receive it. Begging them that they would come to the knowledge of the truth and come out of the things of the world. Look, Jesus never did that. Jesus understood that there is amazing worth in what he has to offer. And if someone's not willing to receive that, then they're not worthy of it anyway. If someone can't come out of the ways of the world enough to see that God has better things for them, then they're not worthy to receive it. So there's no reason to beg someone to receive the gospel, to receive the truth. It's only a benefit to them. And I know our hearts get attached to this, especially with our family. We just desire so bad that they would come to know the Lord and that we wouldn't have this weight on us. Who knows what it's going to be like in eternity? But it would be terrible if there was this weight, even for the rest of your life, that somebody died not knowing the Lord in your family, right? But what God is saying is he has control over these things. He takes care of them. He's the one who chooses. Yes, he wants you to do the work. He wants you to come to know him, and he wants you to teach other people about him but he already knows who is going to. We talked about the parable of the sower where the farmer goes out and just scatters the seed. And we talked about how the farmer already knew that three out of the four places that he was going to scatter the seed 
wasn't going to produce fruit, which is what a farmer is after, that a person would grow up and bear fruit, that the farmer could have the harvest. But Jesus telling that story knows that three out of the four places are not going to bear fruit, and yet he scatters the seed anyway. So it's the same with us. Some people aren't going to receive it. Some people are going to receive it and then fall away. Yet, he doesn't call us to make that distinction. He doesn't call us to judge. He just calls us to scatter the seed wherever he gives us opportunity. That's what our lives need to be about. Planting seeds. Living for him. It can be something small. It's a seed. Seeds are small, right? I know now we get the instant gratification of we can go down to a nursery and we could buy a big giant plant and just go put it in the yard. But it wasn't always like that. For much of history, people took a little tiny seed and they put it in the ground and they waited. Do you hear me? They waited. I know we're not used to that word here, but they waited for something to happen. It's the same thing with sharing the gospel. You just plant a seed and you wait for something to happen. I was in a store this past week and uh, some of you know the story of how like I started, I started off slow sharing the gospel with people face to face because I was afraid, like we all are, you know? You're scared to talk to someone about the Lord. So the way I started, the way the Lord led me to start was to just say, God bless you to people. Like when I left a situation, when I got off the phone with someone, when, so like a lot of times when I do this is when I go into the store, I'll pay for something. And when I leave, I say, hey, God bless you. Have a good day. And I'll leave, okay? Well, I was doing that in a store here in town. And I don't know, I guess I'm just in my own world too much, but I didn't realize who was around me. And so I had my transaction with the clerk she gave me my receipt, and I said, God bless you. I'll see you later. And this other guy was standing right there, and he stopped me, and he was like, wow, that's such a great thing to say to end a conversation. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like, I was taken back. I didn't know what to say. I'm like, yeah. But you could see, like, on his face how it really affected him. Something so simple, like some, saying, saying, God bless you, touched that guy's heart. And I'm like, wow, Lord, like that is the picture of a seed. It's just one little small thing that the Lord can make grow and flourish and bear fruit. It's the same thing for us. Just plant little seeds. Don't try to do too much. Don't take too much pressure on yourself. It's not your job. Just plant little seeds. Stay in the word. Stay doing the things that God wants you to do. Because if you don't, you're going to fall right back into the things of the world. It's so easy. It comes tugging at your flesh every single day. But don't go toward the, the culture. Go opposite the culture. This is what God is calling us to be. That when Jesus sent his disciples out two by two, this is what he said to them in Matthew 10. He said, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Such imagery there. He's saying, hey, we're not called to look like the world. The world is full of wolves. You ever seen those, um, there's those bumper stickers now, ever since COVID, they say, um, lions, not sheep. I appreciate what they're trying to say. I really do. But as Christians, that's not who we are. Yeah, the Lord will give us the boldness of lions. But we're called to be sheep. We're called to follow him. I know it's much easier to go out like Peter did in the garden and take your sword out and start hacking off people's ears. It's way easier to do that because it feeds your flesh. It's natural to you. 
But God gives you the freedom to be different than that. God gives you the freedom to love people. God gives you the freedom to care for people. God gives you the freedom to forgive people who hurt you. Remember what Jesus said from the cross? He's hanging there and people are yelling at him, saying all kinds of loud and nasty things. And he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. I'm sure there were many things that he could have said in that situation. There are many other things that I would have wanted to say. I could tell you that right now. But he says, forgive them. He had the freedom to be different. That is the price that he paid for you too. You have the freedom to be different. You don't have to be like the world. Go opposite the culture. Go opposite the things of the world. We talked about this. We all agreed that our culture today is not good. You know why it's not good? It's because people are going toward the culture and not toward God. People are going toward the world and not toward God. So I encourage you, look at this list. Read in chapter three on your own time by yourself. Look at this list and say to yourself, what am I of these? What is there that I need to get out of my life? Because this is not the list of people who are Christians. This is people who are not Christians. Paul also says this in Romans chapter one. I just read this this morning and I thought it was amazing. It's a little bit long, but it's worth it if I can get to it here. In Romans 1 verse 20, just listen along. I don't have it on the screen. He says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. This is idolism. I know we don't like make physical idols much. I mean, I know there's like Buddha statues that people are all into today, but they used to make like idols of animals and things. But just because we don't have a physical idol doesn't mean we don't make idols out of animals. <laughs> I mean, how many people like to hunt and fish? It could easily be an idol in your life. Anything that takes the place of God and pulls you away from him, that's an idol in your life. 24, he says, Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. You see, this is the mark of a culture who's chasing after the world. Because cultures that go after God look different than this. But you can see in our culture how all of the things that we've chased after, how all of the things that we call social justice to set people free of has only enslaved them more Look at it. 
Look at the homosexual and trans movement. Look at the feminist movement. Look at all these things that the world has said, oh yeah, let's go after these things. It'll really help people. Has it? No. It's only given up people more into the debauchery of the culture. It's only pushed them further away from God, not closer. And we say, oh, this is what love looks like. Oh, if you really love people, you'll allow them to love whoever they want. What? No, if you really love people, you'll tell them that doing the things that they're doing will send them to hell. Because that's for all eternity. Not just in this life. I don't know. I just have a hard time with it. People go these ways. Even Chris, even churches go these ways. And I'm like, what? I was in a big church this past weekend, well, a couple days ago. Big, giant church. And they were bumping some music that didn't have anything to do with God. In fact, it was the opposite. And I just happened to be standing by the bathroom, and they had a... Had a, uh, a um, library there, you know, just small, like little cute church library. And one of the books that they were putting out there for everyone to see, like the prominent book in there said, what the American church is missing. And I'm like, I can't imagine what that book says and why they have it in this church. Because I'll tell you what the American church is missing. The American church is missing Jesus. It's gone after the culture for so long that it looks more like the culture than it does like God. And it's okay with it. It's only about how many people come in. Oh, if we pack the place out, that means we're successful. No, it doesn't. We have a little small church here. What do we have? Like probably 60, 70 people that come here. And we had 14 people get baptized a month ago or whatever it was. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. But that's what I see as successful. Like people coming to know the Lord and having a relationship with him. I don't care if there's a million people here. If, if no one's coming to know the Lord, it doesn't matter for anything. We're just a social club. We have to be different than that. We have to be different than the things of the world. We have to be different than what the world is. God wants us to be different. Yes, we need to care for for people. We need to invite people in. We need to love them. But we need to love them to Jesus, not love them more into the culture. We're all sinners, but we can't stay where we're at. We got to keep moving forward. That's what God calls us to be, people who move forward. You know, we all have friends. Anybody got like worldly friends, friends that are like, yeah, okay, thanks for raising your hand. God bless you guys. Yeah, we all got, you should have friends that are worldly because who are you going to share the gospel with if you don't have people who don't know Jesus? But here's where the rub is with this, because A lot of times us as Christians, we got worldly friends and we hang out with our worldly friends. But sometimes we can start looking like our worldly friends. We can start acting like our worldly friends. And God says that this shouldn't happen. It should be the opposite. Yeah, you should have worldly friends. Even Jesus had worldly friends. But his worldly friends became more like him. He didn't become more like them. It's the same thing for us. Yeah, we need to have worldly friends, but we need to be strong in the faith that our friends will become more like us and be drawn toward the Lord like we are than for us to be drawn toward the world like they are. That's the call on each one of our lives. That we would come out of the things of the world and we would bring other people out of the things of the world. His desire is for people to know him. Don't 
sell yourself short. Don't lower yourself to anybody else's level. God has given you freedom. Freedom from yourself, from sin, from shame, from the enemy, from even hell itself. And he desires that you would walk in that freedom. That you wouldn't look like these things that we just read. But you would be different than that. You would look the exact opposite. You would be salt and light to a world that is full of darkness. That is God's call for each one of us. Don't let the world sell you something that is not of the Lord. Too many people have bought it already and you could see the way the culture is going because of it. It would be easier and much more wise for each one of us when we see the culture going in one direction, when we see things on the news going in a certain direction, that we would go the opposite way. Understand that the world is not going toward God. It never will. Don't agree with it. Love the world, but don't agree with it because it's only going to drag you down. It only wants to get you close to the cliff and then belly bump you off, you know? That's what it wants to do. Don't get anywhere near that cliff. Stay on the straight and narrow path and God will guide your way. Lord, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for giving us your word that we can stay true to who you are. That we can know what you desire and require of us. God, and we can walk in that every single day. Lord, would your spirit just come upon all of us here to do that work? We know it's not of us. God, the strength is not in us, but it's in you. So bless your great name. Take us by the hand and lead us where you want to go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen.